Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning to members of the media. Good morning to the viewing and listening public to another in our post-cabinet press briefing um, sessions. This morning, we are going to be having presentations from the Honorable Favor Williams, who is our Minister of Education, Youth, and Information. I will be your host, and we, are all, we also have present with us this morning Dr. Grace McLean, Acting Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information, Dr. Kassan Troop, Chief, Chief Executive Officer, Acting in the Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information, Ms. Gabrielle Wilkes, who is Legal Officer in the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, Ms. Gail Mitchell, who is a Legal Officer in the National Solid Waste Management Authority, and welcome to all our support staff from the Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information. We will now welcome the Minister, who will give her presentation on the decisions of Cabinet Minister. Thank you, Minister Morgan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Let me acknowledge the Honorable Robert Nestor Morgan, Minister of State in the Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information, Dr. Grace McLean, Permanent Secretary Acting, Dr. Kassan Troop, or Chief Education Officer Acting, Mrs. Gabriel Wilkes, Legal Officer, Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, Ms. Gail Mitchell, Legal Officer, National Solid Waste Management Authority, other support staff from the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information, members of the media, good morning. I begin with the first uh, major decision from Cabinet, which is the establishment of multi-sectoral body for the final report of a study on children living and working on the streets of Jamaica. Cabinet gave approval for the public release of the findings of the final report of a study on children living and working on the streets of Jamaica. Cabinet also approved the establishment of a multi-sectoral body named the Street and Working Children Task Force to review and finalize a street and working children framework of action. The multi-sectoral body will oversee the implementation of the framework of action in order to cauterize and significantly reduce the prevalence of children living and working on the streets in Jamaica. Children working on the streets is indicative of a lifestyle of significant risk. The last survey on this vulnerable population was undertaken at a time that predated the passage of the Child Care and Protection Act in 2004. That was 17 years ago. The purpose of the study is to determine factors that serve to predispose children to living and working on the streets, inclusive of trafficking victims that may be invisible, and to identify gaps in the provision of care and social protection services that could impede an effective response to addressing the street children. The Child Protection and Family Services Agency, CPFSA, and the Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information will use the results and recommendations from the study to inform policies and program interventions relating to street children in Jamaica. The report was tabled yesterday in Parliament. I move now to the next decision of Cabinet, which relates to the disposal of properties owned by the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica. Cabinet gave approval for the properties owned by the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica to be disposed of and or divested. This activity is in keeping with the policy framework and procedures manual for the divestment of government-owned lands. The decision will see PCJ properties in Font Hill, St. Elizabeth, transferred directly to the Urban Development Corporation for its use. The, the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica property located at 36 Trafalgar Road in Kingston will be rented at rates to be negotiated in the short term. These activities are in line with a cabinet decision in August 2019 where it was agreed that the core functions 
of the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica be integrated into the Ministry of Science, Energy, and Technology. The ongoing winding up of the operations of the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica is consistent with the efforts of the government to rationalize public sector bodies. Cabinet also gave approval for the winding up of the Jamaica Marketing Company Limited, Jamco, and for the entity to be struck from the records of the company's house in London, United Kingdom. Jamco was incorporated in the UK in 1970 as a limited liability company in response to the crisis in the marketing of Jamaica's bananas in the UK. This was brought on by the unilateral termination of Effley's Group Limited contract with the Banana Board to market Jamaica's bananas. With the resolution of trade disputes between, between the United States and the European Union in 2002, JAMCA's lobbying efforts were significantly reduced. An objective strategic review of JAM, JAMCO's role and future was conducted, and it was decided that the company should be made dormant to make more targeted use of limited resources. We move on now to the request for approval of the settlement and financial support to the National Solid Waste Management Authority, NSWMA, for claim arising out of a fire at the Riverton Disposal Site on February 12, 2012. Cabinet gave approval for the settlement and financial support of claims in the amount of $4,557,437.44 to be made to the National Solid Waste Management Authority arising from a fire at the Riverton Disposal Site on February 5, 2012. The fire lasted several days and the smoke abatement process lasted approximately 17 days. Thick persistent smoke and resultant toxic fumes blanketed entire communities in the parishes of St. Catherine, St. Andrew, and Kingston and produced a nuisance to several communities. The claimants sustained personal injuries, lost damage, and incurred expenses and took legal actions the result of which found that the NSWMA had breached its obligations under the NSWMA Act 2001 by failing to take the necessary steps for the effective management of solid waste at Riverton Disposal Site in order to safeguard public health. Item number five is a, also a request for approval for the settlement and financial support to the NSWMA as well for um, claims arising out of fires at the Riverton disposal site on February 6, 2012 and March 7, 2015. Cabinet gave approval for the settlement and financial support of claims in the amount of $20,411,156.94 arising from a fire at Riverton Disposal Site on February 6, 2012 and March 7, 2015. On February 7, 2019, the claimants filed a claim through their attorneys alleging that on or around March 7, 2015, a fire was ignited at Riverton, consuming much of the facility and continued until on or around March 29, 2015, and produced a nuisance to several communities. The claimants sustained personal injuries, lost damage, and incurred expenses and took legal action. We move on now to reports. Cabinet received and approved the following annual reports and or financial statements to be tabled in Parliament. Jamaica Fire Brigade 2016-2017, Jamaica Railway Corporation 2017-2018.
We move now to contracts. Cabinet gave approval for the award of two contracts to enforce the existing government broadband network in support of COVID-19 national emergency communication backbone. The contracts were awarded to Syncon Technologies Solutions Limited and Productive Business Solutions Limited in the amount of US $589,781.54 US cents, excluding GCT and US $9,401.48 respectively. Cabinet also gave approval for the award of a contract for general insurance coverage and brokerage services for the National Water Commission for the second year, May 28, 2021, to May 27, 2022, of a three-year contract. And this was awarded to Marathon Insurance Brokers as follows. Placement of US denominated policies for US $3,121,821, excluding GCT. Placement of Jamaica denominated policies in the amount of $29,716,936, excluding GCT. Cabinet gave approval for the award of a contract for the Hunslow Water Supply and Upgrade Project, extension to Fort Charles, Hopewell Road to Fort Charles Transmission Pipeline in St. Elizabeth. The contract is for $112.6 million, and it was awarded to GECO Consultants and Construction Limited. Cabinet also gave approval for the award of a contract for the supply and delivery of seven 2020 model year water trucks for U.S. $627,130 dollars inclusive of GCT, and that contract was awarded to Tankwell Metals Limited. And that concludes the major cabinet decisions. I now turn to education. This morning, in response to questions being asked about students who would have deferred all or some of their subjects in the sitting of CSEC and CAPE exams, and would have done so by the May 21st deadline, we want to assure those students that provisions will be made at the schools they currently attend to facilitate their continued attendance and the sitting of those exams in January or June of 2022. We recognize the difficulties of the health crisis that we all have had to endure since March 2020 and that not all of our students would have been ready to sit their exit exams. It was agreed with CXC that an option to defer would be extended to students. The official numbers from the OEC are that 7,567 students deferred all or part of their CSEC exams to January or June of 2022 and that 429 students deferred their CAPE exams to June of 2022. Of the 7,567 students who deferred the CSEC, 1,026 are private students, 406 are evening students, 195 are tertiary students, meaning, for example, students who are attending community colleges. After you subtract those figures, students in the secondary schools or high schools would total 5,940, and these were from 147 high schools. And um, when you look at the subject areas, there are 34 different subjects. The Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information will work with school leaders to ensure a smooth integration of these students into their respective schools uh, come September of the new school year. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, we will now have our question and answer segment, which will be moderated by 
Miss Lisa, Mrs. Lisa Williams, um, Mrs. Will Mrs. Lisa Williams, Roe, my humblest apologies. You may go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's begin with the questions. We are using the Zoom platform, so members of the media. Remind you of the rules. You raise your hand in order to ask a question. Uh, once you are acknowledged, please unmute yourself. State the media house that you are representing. And, of course, we'd want your name. Uh, let me jump to Mr. Prince Moore. He explained that he was having some technical issues, and so he would have sent his questions uh, via text. So Prince Moore, he's asking, Prince Moore from the RGR Gleaner Communications Group, he's asking, can the minister say whether she's optimistic that students are better prepared for CXC exams, which start on Monday? Minister Williams. I'm assuming by better prepared, you mean relative to last year? Is that what you mean? I, let me check with Mr. Moore. I believe so. Or just in light of the circumstances that they're, they're working with for this period. Okay. Um, so, um, we all know that all of us in Jamaica, you know, have been going through, living through the pandemic. Um, it has not been an easy time, and certainly it has not been easy for our students. Um, but despite going through the pandemic, we've had to still prepare for exit exams, because there are many students who indicated that they want to sit the exams, they want to carry on with their lives. However, we are aware that not all students would have indicated that they are prepared for the exam. And so you would have seen the many uh, conversations that were had, the many consultations, meetings, to try to come to a, 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 a medium uh, to find a balance for our students. And you would have seen the accommodations, which included deferring the exams, um, granting, uh, delaying, delaying the start of the exams, deferring the exams, uh, persons who did not feel comfortable to do so. Um, you would have seen the release of subject areas and among some of the, uh, other, uh, some of the actions that were taken. Are all our students fully prepared this year for the exam? No. But I believe that the students who have made the decision to go forward with the exam, they have been preparing themselves. Um, they would have understood exactly what would be required of them. And they, having taken the decision to go ahead with the exam, I believe that um, they will be given it their best. And, um, you know, as, they, as the date comes along, uh, which is, the, it starts at the end of, on Monday, on Monday, sorry, on Monday. Um, I believe that the students who have decided to take the exams will go in and do their best for those exams. Um, in terms, we will know when the results come and when we make the comparison, um, you know, whether or not they would have done better or about the same as they did last year. It's been difficult for everyone, and we want to wish all our students all the best as they continue to prepare in these last days leading up to the exam. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Williams. We're now going to move to uh, Mr. Siobhan Campbell. So Siobhan, you can just unmute. If you don't mind, we'd like to see you as well if you have a photo up, or you could just uh, let us see your camera. There we go. And you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so Siobhan, we're not hearing you. Go again. Still not hearing you. All right, so Siobhan, while we sort that out, see if you can... S send the message, uh, the question in the chat. All right, let's move now to Ms. Nadine Wilson-Harris while 
uh, Siobhan sorts out his technical matter there. Uh, Nadine Wilson-Harris, please go ahead and mute and ask your question. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to know, as it relates to the opportunity for persons to um, gain access to venues, stakeholders to gain access to venues rent-free, as, as announced uh, yesterday, I would like to know what are the qualifications, um, you know, in terms of persons who have such interest, who will be reviewing, who are the persons that will get um, the special privilege. Also, I would I noticed that there was a letter in today's um, Gleaner from a teacher who said that he hasn't been paid um, in the last four months and he's aware of other teachers who have had similar fees. Um, I would like to know if there's an issue currently in terms of paying teachers, whether there has been any complaints to the Ministry of Education um, as it relates to that issue. And if so, what, what, what is the reason for this? Thank you. Now, Minister Morgan will respond to the first questions. Thank you very much. I will respond to your first query, and then I'll ask the PS to respond to the matter related to teachers' salaries. Um, the Prime Minister did outline yesterday that there is a standard process for getting approval for hosting events, which includes the local authority who, where the fees have been reduced by 50%. It also includes for large events, you would probably have to engage with the Ministry of Culture. I do not think that there is any stipulation that it has to be a privileged or special person. All Jamaicans who are doing legitimate businesses can apply to the relevant authorities. Um, I will ensure that further clarity, since that there seems to be some confusion, will be issued today by the Ministry of Culture and also the Ministry of Entertainment on the matter. So the process is pretty standard as has always been local authority in this case for particular events you'd have to go through the ministry of culture and so on so there's no special person or special privilege all jamaican citizens doing legitimate engagement can apply and can get the benefit permanent secretary okay so nadine let me first uh indicate to that teacher that we have taken note of the letter. I have personally read it and we have started to do our investigation specifically concerning the matter that was raised uh, in that letter. Just to say that the 2020-2021 school year has been an unusual year because we had to ensure that we provide additional temporary staff for our schools during the period. Of course, you know, there were many plans that we had last year during the, the summer period. Then those plans were aborted for the month of September. We started with a, a pilot of face-to-face -face in October. And you would have seen what would have happened throughout the year and is still happening now as we speak. Because of this, there were teachers who were engaged at the local level based on approval given by the central ministry for specific periods of time. If you notice, that teacher mentioned irregular payments. We will have to investigate to find out if it's a case where that teacher was engaged for, let's say, two months or three months, then he would no longer be on the payroll and we would have to have him back on the payroll for another period if he's engaged. So it's one of those unusual years. Uh, we have had many challenges in terms of the payments this year. We have satisfactorily dealt with, I would say, 99% of these challenges. And for those that we have not dealt with as yet, it's just that we have some other issues to sort through. For example, in some cases, some teachers volunteered and hence the paperwork did not move from the school to the central ministry, and hence no payment would have been processed. But I want to assure our teachers that they are very important to us, their payment is very important to us, and we are seeking to do everything that we possibly can to ensure that we do not have these, these issues go 
going into the future. And Minister, if I may say, uh, you would have approved for us to start rolling out the My HR Plus uh, system for our teachers, where our teachers will now be able to access information. Information will, we will be able to obtain electronically, and this will shorten the process in terms of the processing for payment. And so we expect that the systems within the ministry will improve significantly. Uh, thank you, Dr. McLean, the Acting Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. Uh, now going to read the question sent in by Siobhan Campbell. And he says, I'd like to know the policy position arising from cabinet deliberations regarding the rideshare company Uber. Minister Morgan. Hi, Siobhan. Um, thank you for your question. You would know that the deliberations of cabinet are confidential, so I cannot say whether yes or no that those deliberations took place. Um, additionally, you may be guided by the commentary of the Minister of Transport, um, the Honorable Robert Montague, who outlined, and it was broadcast on your program, your station this morning, that any person who is picking up or dropping off public passengers must acquiesce to the rules that exist that are being um, in, governed by the Transport Authority and the relevant legislation. So that is basically the position of the government. Anyone who is transporting public passengers must acquiesce for a fear, must acquiesce to the rules, relevant licensing, relevant insurance regime, relevant numbers and so on. So that is the position that was outlined by the minister. And if you need further clarity on the matter, I'm sure as the minister did on your station this morning, he'll be willing to give further clarity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister Morgan. Now going to move to Ms. Zara Burton. Ms. Zara Burton, could you just please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question? Okay. Hi, good morning, everybody. My question is for Minister Williams. I wanted to understand where we are with Petrojam ownership. Do we 100% own Petrojam at this stage? And also, what has been the response from the Venezuelan government related to our taking over of their shares? Also, could you give an update as to how much money, if it is in escrow, or has it been paid over to the Venezuelan government? So that's question one. Uh, Minister Burton, William. one moment. Those are three questions. So allow Minister Williams to digest all of that here, all of which you're asking. Allow her to respond, and then afterwards we'll just allow the additional questions to follow. Okay. okay. All right. Um, with regards to those questions on Petrojam, one, I am going to uh, to ask you to allow me to get updated information for that. As far as I know, the government of Jamaica is still 100% owner of Petrojam, but in terms of whether or not there's been any movement um, with regards to Venezuela or the exact amount of funds that are in escrow, I would have to get an update on that. So if you don't mind, um, I can get those answers and maybe send them to you or come back to the next press briefing with those numbers. All right, Ms. Burton, you had a follow-up question? Yes, I wanted to know, is it possible to get those answers, Minister Williams, today or tomorrow regarding Petrojam and just where things stand? And also, when you were Minister of Energy at the time, could you say whether you had had any kind of correspondence with Venezuela's response to our taking over of their shares? What was the Venezuelan government's response? All right, so Ms. Burton, Minister Williams would have indicated that you should just submit those questions and allow her time to uh, submit the responses to you. And I'll just allow her to answer the second question, which was Venezuela's when response. She was, yes, when she was the Minister of Energy. Okay. Um, 
in terms, you're asking about Venezuela's response to the proposal. Um, you would have well, heard- Well, it wasn't a proposal. I thought it was an action. An so action. Well, you would have heard all the um, deliberations in parliament. Um, you would have um, also heard the amendments that were made um, to legislation. Uh, and again, since then, I have not um, kept abreast with any changes that might have happened in the Ministry of Science, Energy, and Technology, but I'll commit to asking that entity to respond to these questions that you have asked and come back to you in good time on them. Okay. Um, right, thank you, uh, Ms. Burton. There are other persons on the platform who had their hands raised for quite a while, so I'm just going to allow them to ask their questions. So, uh, Ms. Tennant, uh, Janique Tennant, just state the media house that you're representing and unmute and ask your question, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm representing our today, and my question is, given the JTA's position against summer school, does the ministry still intend to move forward with the summer school come July? Okay. So the ministry would have laid out a plan for summer school. I mean, I can take this off now for summer school and for the national homework and after school program for the upcoming school year. We would have spent the last week uh, doing our consultations and meetings with the various stakeholders. We still have some additional meetings or um, you know, town hall meetings to do um, with parents and, and other stakeholders. Among those groups with which we spoke last week, would be the uh, leadership of the Jamaica Teachers Association. And I believe after going through and allowing question and answers and doing the presentation that um, I believe the JTA walked away with a better understanding of what it is that we're planning to do to help to restore uh, the, uh, well, help to reduce the learning gap that our students have and to help to put them on a path where they are able to make up for what it is that they did not um, learn during this past year and to help to accelerate them along the path in terms of their educational pursuit. I believe, and, and we will be um, coming to the larger Jamaican audience in short order to also allow them to understand what it is that the plans are um, for summer school, uh, but we're, we, we have to meet with parents and then we would open it up to the wider Jamaicans in order for them to understand and be supportive of what we have been doing. We know that for the past, well, since March of last year, we've been living through a pandemic. Our students have not been able have not been able to be in the face-to-face -face mode. We have done our best in terms of engaging them on various platforms, primarily utilizing the online or the virtual space, but we've made other uh, platforms available as well, television, radio. We've ensured that our students have their textbooks and worksheets and are in touch with their teachers but we know that there is uh, you know, a large segment of the students who were not engaged at all or were barely engaged. And we have to find those students. Beginning this summer, we have to go into communities. We have to get them in small groups of 10 or so. We have to engage them for at least two hours during the day to begin to get them back into that mindset of school and of learning again. We have to do it as a ministry. We have you know, every obligation to do it, and I believe that we would be irresponsible if we did not have a plan for summer and for um, the upcoming school year in terms of providing our, our children with additional uh, hours uh, so that they could have their con the concepts that they learn in class reinforced repeated, you know, t 
taught again, allowed them additional time to ask questions and, and to really learn uh, what it is uh, that they uh, you know, are, are hearing from their teachers in the classroom uh, when we go back into the face-to-face -face mode. I know that this is a big task for the ministry and all the persons that are involved, but we have to do it. Uh, the, we cannot afford for the learning loss to persist. We have to catch up, we have to close the gap, and we have to take our students well beyond where they were when this pandemic started. And we believe that the JTA is on board in terms of the plans that were laid out to them. Thank you, Minister Williams. Uh, the, uh, another question coming from Nadine Wilson-Harris. On okay, mute. I have uh, some follow-up for um, Dr. Grace McLean, and I also have some questions as it relates to um, the Riverton City, uh, the claims that, that, that have been brought forward. Um, for Dr. McLean, I wanted to find out as it relates to the teachers that were employed temporarily, can you say how many um, and how many have not been received payments as yet? Also, I wanted to find out, we're part of us about how many, teach, uh, how many students have not, have not been involved in terms of um, academic work just disappeared from the system. Can you speak to how many teachers we have in that situation that haven't reported for, class, um, for classes online during this whole COVID period? As it relates to the Riverton City, um, uh, city one, uh, one moment, uh, uh, Ms. Wilson Harris. Let's allow Dr. McLean to respond, and then you ask the questions uh, directed to the representatives here from the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development and the National Solid Waste Management Authority. So, Dr. McLean. So, so Nadine, currently, I have three teachers who we are actually doing the investigation regarding their payments. Two of those teachers actually were employed for a set period and then they indicated that they volunteered to continue their services for another period. So we are doing the checks to see really what happened from the school's perspective, and then we will make a decision as to how we treat with these matters. So those are the two that I have currently. Of course, we would have seen the one that was reported this morning in the Gleena, and as I indicated, we have started the investigation. Now, the ministry has carried a temporary a budget for temporary staff over time, meaning not only teachers, but also support staff. And that was the funds that we utilized for the engagement of a little over 600 teachers at different times. So they were not employed for a full year. Some were employed for three months, four months, six months, based on the need. As it relates to teachers who are missing from the virtual space, I would not be able to provide you with that information because I don't think, Dr. Troop, we have teachers who are missing. We provided different modalities and our teachers have been supporting our principals. They have a handle in terms of the entire staff of the institution and they can report to us how they have been utilizing our teachers. So we can't at this time say if teachers, are, well, we can at this time say that none of our teachers are missing from supporting within the institutions. Of course, we continue to monitor and as information is provided, we will take whatever action that we need to take. Uh, Minister, with your permission, I think there is a, a part of her question relating to the learning, yes. the students who have been not been engaged. So I could ask CEO to speak to that uh, area. Okay. Good morning, Minister. Good morning, everyone. So as PS indicated, we have not been advised of our teachers being missing. We know we have a few teachers and students who would have indicated to our principals that they have comorbidities. And so those individuals would have been facilitated from the remote perspective. We have over um, 3,000 students who would have indicated and about 400 and something teachers would have indicated across the system that there are comorbidities. And so our principals would have worked out an arrangement with them for them to deliver their duties in the remote perspective. So things are going good there. With respect to the 120,000 students that we would have not been able to account for consistently, um, we know from the reports that some of these students 
are in and they are out. So they are not the same students all the time that are missing, but nonetheless, we would have seen coming through our school reports consistently about 120,000 students who are missing. So what our minister indicated earlier is that this summer school is designed predominantly in mind, um, with those students in mind, not that the other students will not be accommodated, but there is a concerted effort to make sure that we locate and to re-engage these students in these opportunities of learning so that they can be better ready for the school experience in the new school year. So that's where we are now with respect to that. But our students are being supported as best as possible. Right now, the education system is in assessment mode. So our principals are going through the diagnostic assessment with them and their in-house assessment activities. All of that data will be utilized to decide how the students will be supported at the school level come September as we re-engage them in the new learning experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Troop, Acting Chief Education Officer, the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information. Now, Ms. Wilson-Harris, you can ask those questions in relation to the claims uh, for persons who would have suffered damage courtesy of the uh, fire at Riverton. Uh, we have two representatives, uh, one from the Ministry of Local Government, the legal officer, uh, Ms. Gabrielle Wilkes and Ms. Gail Mitchell, the legal officer at the National Solid Waste Management Authority. So either ladies should be able to respond to your question, so you can go ahead and ask. Thank you. Just want to know how many persons are set to benefit um, from the two payments that were announced earlier. And I would also like an update as it relates to the divestments of the Riverton City Dump. I know that a team had been put in place some time ago. Thank you. Morning to you, Mrs. Wilson Harris. All right, there are 21 persons who are set to benefit from the who who yes are set to benefit from being paid um, in respect of damages claimed for uh, out of the 2012 and 2015 fires, and as regards the uh, divestment, there are very. The only thing I'm able to say at this point, very vigorous talks in respect of um, closure of Riverton, for example, and the uh, works that are supposed to be done in respect of waste energy transformation. And the enterprise team, I believe, though, have uh, quite a bit of initiative that they are proposing. And so along with the National Solid Waste Management Authority, we are in discussions presently with them to flesh out those ideas. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gail Mitchell, it's the legal officer of the National Solid Waste Management Authority. Uh, Nadine, I hope uh, you are satisfied with that response. Checking the platform, there's one final question now from Ms. Burton. Ms. Burton, go ahead on mute, ask your question. Thank you again. This question is for um, either um, Minister Morgan or for Acting Permanent Secretary McKean. I wanted to find out in general, why is it that Ms. Burton? Under the Asked Information Act. Uh, Ms. Burton, for a moment, Ms. Burton, for a moment there. Provision we... for a request of documents. Ms. Burton, can you hear me? The ATI, through the Ministry of Education, we apply for documents. However, in recent years, I have noticed that at the Ministry of Education specifically, every time you have a question, whether it's a matter of getting just basic information about a policy decision or just a follow-up like happened last cabinet post-cabinet post briefing. We're being asked to put in ATI requests and those are for documents. I wanna understand why the Ministry of Education relies so heavily on ATIs to go in even when there are no documents being requested, but just answers being sought. That's question part one. Part two, last cabinet meeting or post cabinet briefing, Minister Morgan, you mentioned something and I just wanted to get clarification on this, please. You said that you had responses 
ATI responses that had been provided to me. I want to understand your role in the process of granting those ATI responses when you said that you had responses in your possession that were granted to me. Good morning, Ms. Burton. Um, the, I'll answer your second question first. When the matter was raised by yourself and others that you were having challenges accessing information from the ministry, I wrote to the ministry to query what is the status of these responses and why have they not been given? And I was advised based on the information that was sent to me that at a particular time you had made requests through the ATI unit and these were the responses that were said to you. I have no particular role in giving responses related to the ATI unit. My duty as a policymaker is to ensure that the system functions efficiently. And if a citizen raises a concern, it is my duty as a minister of state who is in charge of information to look into the matter to see whether or not there were challenges. As it relates to your first question, why is it that the ministry relies on ATI? I do not know if I would associate myself with that conclusion. I remember at the last meeting you raised challenges getting information and I said to you as the minister, if it is that you're having challenges, you can send an ATI request and you can also send an email to me. And further conversations took place on social media where I actually gave you my email asking you to outline to me what the challenges were and what the questions you have were. I have not received an email. So I'm willing here as a servant of the people to assist where there are challenges within the system to ensure that the law that is outlined and the rights of citizens are protected and where there are questions to be raised as best as possible. If there are bottlenecks and if there are perceived challenges assist those citizens. That is my role as a minister, and that is the role that I do every day. Thank you, Minister Morgan. On that note, we are going to end our uh, bi-weekly post-cabinet press briefing. Want to acknowledge the Honorable Favel Williams, Minister of Education, Youth and Information, who would have delivered uh, the cabinet deliberations and also updates on education, youth, and information. We were, of course, supported by the Honorable Robert Nesta Morgan, Minister of State in the Ministry of Education, Youth, and Information, Dr. Grace McLean, the Permanent Secretary acting in the Education Ministry, and so too Dr. Kassan Troop, who is the Chief Education Officer acting at the Education Ministry, and also uh, say thanks to Ms. Gabrielle Wilkes, the Legal Officer at the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, and Ms. Gail Mitchell, the legal officer at the National Solid Waste Management Authority. Special thanks to other support staff from the Education Ministry, and of course also to our media partners who are so uh, uh, very engaging this morning by asking their questions. Uh, see you again in two weeks' time. Have a great morning and a productive rest of the week. Thank you.